Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is segment two, verbal conceits or wordsmithing. Okay, so what conceits means in poetry is hidden word meanings. I believe that the first folio technique really brings the hidden word meanings to the actor. Again, remember that Shakespeare's actors use the Q script, and I believe that they could visually see the clues on the Q script, and that's how they learn to do what I call road mapping, right? They, they could figure out their script analysis and make their blueprint or road map from what was literally on the, on the text. Why I believe this is because from Philip Henslow's diaries, he wrote everything down. He wrote when the actors were late, when they were drunk, if they tore their costume. He kept a catalog of how many plays were done every season. And what we see is that there was 40 plays usually done every season, right? Which meant that the actors were rehearsing them in three days and performing them on the fourth. So my question is, how could these actors do this when the Royal Shakespeare Company takes three months to prepare a play, my company, American Globe Theater, we always took, cheated, at least six weeks to, to prepare a play. And these people supposedly did it in three days. And my belief is that it's because they were able to sight read the text, like a musician sight reads music and they could, pl they could play it. So today we're going to begin with The Taming of the Shrew and we're gonna start with Petruchio. I need you to remember that Taming of the Shrew, Love's Labor's Lost, Comedy of Errors, and The Two Gentlemen of Verona are the four plays that Shakespeare based on commedia. For us today, that would be more farcical and the broader acting style. Although today people change the plays, but that's the way it was originally done. It says at the top of this Q script, Mene Petruchio. Mene means alone. So the actor would have known that they were alone on stage. And he says, but here she comes, and now, Petruchio, speak. My first question to you all is, how does Petruchio, if Catherine's not on stage, how does she, he know that she's coming? So many productions cheat, and they have Catherine scream off stage uh, when her father's pushing her out the door, and that he hears her, and then he says this line. I question that because Shakespeare does this a lot. In Romeo and Juliet, the nurse is always announced before she enters. People say, here comes the nurse, the nurse is coming, the nurse comes. And so my question is, is these actors playing these roles might have needed some kind of prodding, some kind of clue to come on, or in the case of the nurse, being that it was an older actor, might have been someone who drank and really had to know, it's your turn, please come on stage. Catherine enters, and Petruchio says, Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name I hear. These are single lines. The first thing that we did in the roadmap, remember, was to see if it's prose or if it's verse. So you've done that as step one. Step two would be to see is it a single line or is it a speech. So when it's a single line, Shakespeare's telling you, I only want you to do one thing, right? Don't complicate it. Make it simple. He says, good morrow, Kate, for that's your name I hear. So you could take it home and analyze it, but basically he's saying, hello, right? And then she has a little speech, which we're gonna go over. And then he has a speech. He says, you lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and Bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate the prettiest Kate in all of Christendom. Normally I then, when there's a class, say, what do you hear that Shakespeare says over and over again? And everybody says, we hear Kate. In Petruchio's 10-line speech to Catherine, he has 17 K sounds. K is the strongest sound in the alphabet, and it's also the funniest sound in the alphabet. Then there is four other consonants that you need to know. K, P, B, F, and T. These sounds are either used for comedy or they're used for stress when Shakespeare's trying to make something stress. If you don't believe me, um, you can read Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boys. And the older actor says to his nep nephew, if it doesn't have a K in it, it's not funny. K is funny. If Neil Simon knows this, then um, I would say that William Shakespeare definitely knew this. There is another example I'd like to give to you. 
In the old days, there was a wonderful TV host named Johnny Carson, who some of you know and some of you don't know. And he did a whole scene with a man named Jack Webb who played a cop, right? It's called Copper Clapper Caper, right? So there's a lot of cuss sounds. And you have to know C and K are in acting are interchangeable. It's called the K sound. It starts out, there's been a robbery. Yes, sir, what was it? My clappers. Your clappers? Yeah, you know those things inside the bell that makes them clang? The clangers? That's right, we call them clappers in the business. A clapper caper. What's that? Nothing, sir. Now, can I have the facts? What kind of clappers were stolen in this caper? They were copper clappers. And where were they kept? In the closet. Uh Uh-huh. I have an idea who might have taken the copper clappers from the closet. (laughs) You have see, tongue twister. Well, just one. I fired a man. He swore he'd get even. What was his name? Claude Cooper. I'm not going to do the whole scene, but you can see that even in television, they know that the K sound is funny and it goes on and on and on. And I think the last line, if I ever catch kleptomaniac Claude Cooper from Cleveland who copped my clean copper clappers kept in the closet, yes, I'll clobber him. The K sound was used for humor. So Petruchio has this speech with 17 K sounds. You lie in faith for your called plain Kate. So called Kate and Bonnie Kate and sometimes Kate the Curse, three in that line. Normally I have a student do this when we're in class, another actor. And because my cameraman refuses to participate, I'm going to have to do it for you. I studied with two men from the Moscow arts and they did everything physical, all their speeches, everything with text, they physicalized it before they did. And what I learned from them is that movement goes beyond meaning. So with Pertuccio's speech where he has 17 Ks, I'm going to physicalize those K sounds. And what I believe Shakespeare was saying was is that you had to build these sounds. You had to say it the second time because it sounded so good the first time. Say it the third time because it sounded so good the second time because it sounded so good the first time. And what you do is you will change your volume, your pitch, your inflection, your intonation. You'll have vocal variety. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple exercise of going up on my toes every time I say K. So here we go. You lie in faith for you are called plain Kate and Bonnie Kate and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates. And therefore, Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtues spoke of, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. So normally people mistake and spoke, and I think I got them. You can see that that speech has a plethora of K sounds. And what Shakespeare was doing was he was saying that repetitions will be in all 37 plays because what he understood was repeating was a way of reinforcing the thought. Repeating was a way of leading you to the meat, to what was important. And that's why I use the the saying, you say it the second time because it sounded so good the first time. You say it the third time because it sounds so good the second time because it sounded so good the first time. So it's like building up steps. And again, you do this by changing your volume, your pitch, your inflection, your intonation. Now I'm going to go over to Catherine for a second. And Catherine's speech, her first speech is, he says, good morrow, Kate, for that's your name I hear. And she says, well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing, they call me Katerine that do talk of me. What I ask the people reading this to say is, what do you hear repeated? And they come up with, have heard hard hearing. So she's got four H's. So I then ask you if to make the voiced sound of an H. And so they go, ha, ha is unvoiced, ha is voiced. Then I say, say it as fast as you can. And they go, ha, 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 ha. And I say faster. And they go, ha, 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 ha. So I say, what could she be doing? And they say, laughing. And I say, yes, that's the conceit. That's the hidden word meaning that Shakespeare's giving her. And then she says, they call me Katerine that do talk of me. So the second me has to be built, has to go up. 
People that say they call me Katerina to talk of me, or worse, people that say they call me Katerina to talk of me. If she's going to make herself this Katerine character and be the all-important person, then the second me has to be bigger, bolder, more verbal relish than the first me. But more importantly, what Shakespeare knew is that the intellect comes out on the consonants and the emotions come out on the vowels. So if you're gonna put heart and soul into anything that's, that you're speaking, you have to learn to take these vowels and give them their full weight. Consonants for me are like chisels and language is like a big piece of clay. And the, the consonants give it a certain shape whereas the vowel give it its emotional size. And she would say, they call me Katharine, that you talk of me, right? And so she might even get a, a, a giggle, a smile, a laugh out of the second me because she elongated, she gave it a, gr a greater weight. The other thing is, is Katharine you see is spelled K-A-T-E-R-I-N-E. And many modern editions go, Shakespeare made a mistake and they put an H in and they make it Catherine. However, I would question that because at this moment, I'm thinking Catherine is having a you go girl moment. She's saying, if you're gonna to talk to me, buddy, you're gonna call me what I wanna be called, Catherine. Why take that away from her? Why take her uniqueness away from her? And it's the only time in the play that she calls herself Catherine. Sometimes they call her Katerina, most of the times they call her Kate, and then sometimes it's, it is Catherine. Petruchio even at the end of this scene will say Catherine. So she has the ha 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 ha, and she has the me me. So again, repetition is a way of reinforcing, repetition is a way of leading you to the meat. Part of the road mapping is finding your repetitions and building them. To build means to do, to do means to have faith, to have faith means to have the faith to do, to act. So your boldness will always give you the authority to act, and so I ask you in the beginning to play with these repetitions until they become, and it will seem unnatural in the beginning, but it will eventually work its way into being natural. Repetitions is the first part of this roadmap in segment two, and then the second thing is I want to do is look at spelling. Petruchio has, but here she comes and now Petruchio speak. Here is spelled H-E-E-R-E -E -E, and speak is spelled S-P-E-A-K-E. -E. When Shakespeare puts an E on the end of a word, he's saying hold it out just a little bit longer. The Elizabethan actor would say, but here she comes, and now, Petruchio, speak. When you give more weight to a word, what happens is it, it changes. It, become, it usually becomes funnier in a, in a different way. I want to use the example of weight of a word. Weight of a word, if you give it its smallest weight, one, it's moved, right? If you give it the th weight of three, it's moved. If you give it the weight of six, it's moved. And if you give it the weight of nine, it's moved. So as absurd as that sounds, it does go literal, comical, farcical, absurd. So the words expand and contract the same way that your heart goes ba dum da dum da dum the same way that iambic pentameter goes, but um, it's unstressed stress, because Shakespeare does everything with humanity. Again, I said earlier that it was the humanity in these plays that makes them last forever and, and ever. Changing the weight of the word is also a way of making it find what I call it's funny, right? It's funny can be comical, uh, farcical, absurd, whatever, but they expand and they contract all the words, and it's the actor's job to find that. He finished with myself and moved to woo thee for my wife. In that line, the moved is spelled M-O-O-V apostrophe D. It's the long version. It's again, it's the comical version. Myself and moved to woo thee for my wife. So the verbal conceit is, there's four M's in that line. My, am, moved, and my. So it's four M's and two O's, moo and woo. The Elizabethan actor would have 
played with this. And what they would have found was that it would be basically mm mm, ooh ooh, mm, right? Which is the him, this Italian Petruchio, flirting and, and seducing this woman, Catherine. And her response is moved, comma, in good time, comma, let him that moved you hither remove you hence, colon. I knew you at the first, you were a movable. So he kk kates her and she moo moo moos him. Shakespeare has given Petruchio a really good button, a last line with myself and move to woo thee for my wife. If he does it right, he'll get a laugh. I have found that the women get the bigger laughs. And so she has moved comma. And we're not gonna discuss punctuation today, but one word in the piece of punctuation with Shakespeare saying you could use all of your breath on it. So again, it could be elongated, right? I think that she comes out with moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first, you were a movable. The Elizabethan actor would have known the first one was the biggest. The second and, thir and third one couldn't be as big because they're in between nine other words. So she, she or he has to divide the breath up. And the last repetition in, symbols in Shakespeare we always call the symbol crash. So it would have gone really big, big, bigger, big, right? And it would again give this actor something to do as compared to counting out the iambic pentameter, which I don't think is exactly what all of them did. That is repetitions as far as consonants and vowels and introducing spelling. So in the roadmap, you went prose or verse, single line, repetition consonants, repetition vowels or diphthongs, the moved is two, dip, the two vowels crashed together, right? And spelling. The last thing I wanna do is that Petruchio says, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. The Elizabethan actor, again, I said they basically had a third grade education, took him literally. So when he hears the word moved, he would move. And when he hears the word woo, he would woo. Now, because I said it was commedia or farce, is how you move, body language, right, could be the funny. There's verbal language, body physical language, and energy language. So the, the Petruchio, who's a little bit of an oddball, would be able to sway himself over, and I don't care what he does. He could blow her a kiss, he could kiss her hand, he could get down on his knees, he could kiss her toes for all I care. But as long as he woos her, because it's known as a stage direction. Stage directions are gifts, and when you hear one, you should do it. That's the physical body language that you have to start to incorporate. And the last thing I want to talk about is capitalized words. Petruchio, again, in his speech says, hearing thy mildness praised in every town. Town is capitalized and it ends in E. Shakespeare capitalized words for only two reasons. Either it was the operative word and it would make the, the sentence make more sense, or it was purely a character choice. To show you that it's an operative word, I'm gonna ask that we go to the Mark Antony speeches, and I'm gonna use a, a folio speech, and I'm gonna use a Riverside speech. I'll read the first 10 lines. Um, in the Riverside speech, I'm only gonna read the capitalized words, and I'm not gonna read the first word because you can see it's verse, so the first word has to be capitalized, and the right-hand side is jagged. In the Riverside, Mark Antony, would, his capitals would be Romans, Caesar, Caesar, Brutus, Caesar, Caesar, Brutus, Brutus, Caesar. That's Riverside. That's a modern edition. All the capitals have been erased. Then when I go back to the folio, you hear this as capitalized words. Romans, countrymen, Caesar, Caesar, noble Brutus, Caesar, ambitious, fault, Caesar, Brutus, Brutus, honorable, honorable, Caesar's funeral. With the folio, you hear 
twice as many capitalized words than you do in modern editions. And I believe that these capitalized words were stepping stones and acted almost as a subliminal message that the audience would hear if the actor stressed them. You want to use them and use them with a, a purpose. Again, we've always said that you have to find the action and the need of the character and do that. So going back to Petruchio, hearing thy mildness praised in every town. Town is capitalized and it has an E on the end of it. I believe Petruchio was supposed to say, hearing thy mildness praised in every town, right? And the audience would go, what the hell did he do that for? And Catherine would go, why did he do that, right? There's no reason that that word needs to be stressed. It's not important, the town's not important. He could have picked any town in Italy. Um, and it's just because Petruchio happens to be a wild and crazy guy. So it's a character choice. Mark Antony is doing operatives and Petruchio is doing character. To sum up today, what we've learned in verbal conceits, wordsmithing is that the characters wordsmith by throwing things back and forth to each other. He kkkates her, she moo moo moos him. This can be called repartee, which is an exchange of words and jousting, and it was a way of people being witty. Remember, they had no TV, no radio, no internet. They spoke for entertainment. They talked for entertainment. So learning to speak in a clever way using your imagination and wit was all important. So to sum it up, prose and verse, repetitions, say it the second time because it sounded so good the first time, spellings, does the weight of the word need to be changed, the distance between the first consonant and the last consonant by elongating it, capitalized words. That is what I would like you to practice today. And I just wanna finish with two modern examples. I know that we said Uncle Will was gonna be our primary focus, but I need you to know that if Shakespeare is not your thing, and it doesn't have to be, is that this also works in modern editions. I'd like to use Lynn Nottage's Intimate Apparel. I think she's a brilliant playwright. I have the greatest admiration for her. She has amazed me with every piece of writing that she's done. But I'm gonna give you just a little section. It's right in the first scene. And Esther, the main character says, but he's still fetching luggage. And Mrs. Dickinson says, not just any luggage, high class luggage. And is high class luggage easier to carry? I reckon it's easier to haul silk than cotton, if you know what I'm saying. Even Lynn Nottage takes the word luggage and she repeats it. And every time you repeat the word, any playwright wants the meaning to change or grow differently, so it's different. And I think what she's saying when she says, I reckon it's easier to haul silk than cotton, right? Is, is that she's talking about slavery in a way, metaphorically. It's because you would, the, the cotton was what the slaves had to haul, right? And now this man she's talking about has become a bellman and he is carrying silk. The last example I wanna give you is from Seinfeld. And it's in a great book, called The Eight Characters of Comedy by Scott Sedita. It's a great book for sitcoms. That's why we're using Seinfeld. And George is gonna talk about Kramer. And he says, Kramer goes to a fantasy camp? His whole life is a fantasy camp. People should plunk down $2,000 to live like him for a week. Sleep, do nothing, fall ass backwards into money, mooch food off your neighbors, and have sex without dating. That's a fantasy camp. Not only is George using K's, but he's repeating the word fantasy camp. And every time he says it, it should change. In our next section, we're going to further this discussion, but this is what I would like you to work on for today. To end today, we always have a quote, and the quote comes from 
Love's Labor's Lost, which is one of your comedias. And Barone is talking to the king. And Barone says, what is the end of study? Let me know. The king says, why? That to know which else we should not know. Barone says, things hid and barred, you mean from common sense? The king says, I, that is study, God like recompense. With that, I hope you study and find all these clues. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next segment. Thank you.